<laughs> just a moment. Uh, um, okay. Okay. So, do, do you see the slide? Yes. 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 Okay. So, yes, thank you very much for this kind of introduction and the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here at this colloquium for the Societe, Societe Italiana di Fisica Statistica. And I want, I, it's a pleasure also to speak about uh, the recent uh, development of uh, network science and in particular about uh, uh, simplicial complex and dynamics. So in, in the field uh, of network science, we have uh, got a very important uh, result about the interplay between network structure and dynamics. And this has really constituted a leap in our understanding of complex system, sparked by the very simple yet very powerful idea that uh, we can get inside into the function of complex system just by looking at the network of their interaction. And actually, why in these 20 years there has been a, a lot of uh, understanding of the statistical property of network structure behind complex system, mainly the broad degree distribution, the small world property. And we have reach with statistical mechanics, we have reached a very important insight into the relation between natural structure and dynamics, because we have seen how this signature of complexity changed the phase diagram of dynamical systems, such as epidemic spreading, percolation, Ising model, and so on. But recently it has been coming more and more clear that we need to make a step forward, that simple networks are somewhat limiting our prediction power of complex systems. And there has been a lot of research in recent years about multi-layer network, for instance, which are network of networks where links uh, can have different connotation, different indicate interaction of different nature and um, connotation. And uh, here I make a shameless ad advertisement of my book on the topic of multilayer network. This is a very, very important generalized network structure that I've allowed to make prediction that uh, were uh, not possible just by looking uh, at a single network formed by northern links. But here I want to tell you about another type of generalized network structure and mainly uh, simplicial complexes. Simplicial complexes differ from network because they are not just formed by node and links, but they are also formed by triangle, tetrahedra, and so on. So they naturally encode the many body interaction that are present in complex systems. And there is a variety of complex system data that can be captured by simplicial complexes. And this includes brain data, where, for instance, three regions of the brain can be activated at the same time. So we have a three-body interaction, which we want to distinguish between uh, um, from a, a just a, a set of three pairwise correlation between the three regions of the brain. And protein interaction network, where we have protein complexes, which are formed by more than two proteins, typically. And also in social network, if you think of face-to-face -face interaction or gathering in a party or in a coffee break of a conference, you see often interaction which includes more than two uh, individuals. And of course, collaboration networks are also very important. And in research, we know that, you know, a research paper is usually the result of a collaboration between more than two authors, two scientists. So what are simplices? Simplices are the building block of simplicial complexes. And a zero simplex is a node, a one simplex is a link, a two simplex is a triangle, 
and a three simplex is a tetrahedra. And in general, a d dimensional simplex is a set of just d plus one nodes. And it's interesting because it in, 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 uh, indicates the interaction between these nodes and so allows us to go behind the pairwise framework of the network and to capture higher order interaction. And it's also important, and here I want to stress this, it's also important because it uh, admits a topological, and if you give a, a length to the link, and this length can be also a one for every link, it, it admits a geometrical interpretation. So really you can interpret the two simplex as a triangle, the three simplex as a tetrahedra, and then you can borrow all the um, information, all the knowledge that is in, in, in geometry and topology, and you can apply to, to, to the complex systems. And so a simplex is characterized by having also a, a set of faces, which are just uh, formed by a subset of its node. So for instance, you have a tetrahedra, a three simplex, which is for which has faces including all its nodes, four, four nodes, all its links, six links, and all its triangle, four triangle. And a simplicial complex math from the mathematical point of view is described just by a set of simplices where you have the additional condition that this set is closed under the inclusion of the face of every simplex. So if you have a triangle there, you must include all the links and all the nodes at this boundary. So this uh, might seem like a bit of a stretch, uh, and in particular, the, the people that favor hypergraph to simplicial complex might uh, stress this difference. But actually, it, it is a minimal, uh, you know, uh, ad generalization that allow to borrow all the mathematics tools uh, that are, are for, that are available for simplicial complex. And here we see we will see in this talk um, how uh, the, the knowledge that one can gain from uh, the mathematics of simplicial complex can be really used in statistical mechanics term to uh, define uh, new uh, dynamical processes and understand the relation between the structure, but at this moment, not only the statistical property of the structure, but also the geometrical and the topological signature of this structure and dynamics. So if we start from the traditional uh, statistical mechanics approach, you know, one of the main property of a network is the degree. So it's natural that you want to generalize the concept of degree to simplicial complex. And we have done so. So we can say that the, the generalized degree d delta of a delta phase nu is given by the d-dimensional simplices incidence to a delta phase mu. So this is seems very complicated, but it's actually very simple. So if you have a node mu, the generalized degree to zero is the number of triangle incident to a node. And if you have a link mu, then the, num the generalized degree k to one is the number of triangle incidence to the link. So let's take an example here. You have a simplicial complex. So you might look at node three, which has generalized degree of the node four because four triangles are incidence to eight, or you can have a link one three, which has generalized degree three because there are three triangle incidence to eight. And then to be used in the future, we introduce an incidence number which is defined for the d minus one phase. So if you have a simplicial complex just formed by d simplices, like here, two dimensional simplices, triangles, then to every link you associate a incidence numbers, which is just the generalized degree minus one. And this is interesting because here you see not uh, the link one three as generalized degree two, but actually these object um, is not a manifold, so you can see that it's not really uh, homomorphic to a surface. And indeed, the combinatorical constraint 
to have a manifold, like for instance, a discrete surface here, is that the incidence numbers cannot be of a, any link, cannot be larger than one. So uh, really this is uh, the, the combinatorial constraint for a manifold, and we will use this in the following. So when you have this simplicial complex from a statistical point of view, person that have worked on modeling uh, on networks for, for many years, one, one natural thing to see is to see if one can model this simplicial complex to have null models uh, where we can run dynamical process that we can, uh, we can study. And the first approach you might imagine is the maximum entropy approach. So you want to have a, a null model which does not contain any uh, information beside, behind uh, you know, the constraint that you uh, impose. And then the, the most natural one is the configuration model in which you want to construct a simplicial complex in which every node has a, general, a given generalized degree of the node. So for instance, here every node has a given number of triangles. So you put some stubs on the nodes, uh, which indicates the number of triangles you want that node to be part of, and then you practically match the stubs in a way that uh, every three stubs form a triangle. And it is possible that in this matching, you generate more than, than one simplex. And the number of simplices that is compatible with the given generalized degree of the nodes is uh, related, strictly related to the entropy of this ensemble. So it, 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 it is the logarithm of this number is the entropy of this ensemble, and it will tell you, practically quantify how strong, um, how much inform is in, how strong is the constraint, how much information is encoded in the constraint. And then you really, you can define this matching, of course, it's not as easy like that. There are some, some matching that are forbidden. So for instance, a, if you want a, 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 a simplicial complex that is not weighted, you cannot allow uh, two triangles to be linked to the same three nodes or there are other moves that are forbidden. But actually, if you take into account this forbidden mood, you can construct uh, really a code that generates from any of these math being a simplicial complex. But if we did something more, so we did not just do the, the algorithm that you can find in my GitHub page, but you can really do the statistical mechanics of this problem. So you can assign a probability to a simplicial complex, have a define the entropy, which is the sign on entropy, and then maximizing the entropy given the constraint, you can really characterize the ensemble, and one of the characterization is clearly the marginal probability. So the probability that you will have a d-dimensional simplex there, and this is given by this expression, which is uh, this logistic function where lambda r are the Lagrangian multiplier enforcing the generalized degree of the node. And as you see, this expression is not simply factorizable in contribution coming from different nodes. Um, uh, but uh, if you have uh, some conditional sparseness of the simplicial complex, so, so if, if you have a maximum degree, which is defined in this way, which scale with n in a particular way, uh, then the, um, the marginal distribution then becomes proportional to the product of the generalized degree of the nodes. And uh, interesting, this cutoff exists also in, in network model, but the scaling with n changes. And you know, you can recover the scaling for the network where d is equal to 1, so you have just links, but then with uh, d equal to 2 and 3, this scaling uh, changes significantly. So then we play, we characterize the entropy uh, in the asymptotic limit here. And actually we played a bit the combinatorics and we um, find the asymptotic expression for the number of simplicial complexes with given generalized degree of the nodes. Um, and is given by this combinatorial expression where each term can be understood combinatorically 
um, when you try to perform uh, the matching actually of the stabs and uh, this formula is for for the equal to one uh, is can be recasted into the famous Bender and Campfield formula for network with given degree sequence, but here we generalize to 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 simplicial complexes. So interesting, I didn't mention this ensemble of simplicial complex, a very non-trivial correlation because when you don't have the structural cutoff. Uh, these, these network have very non-trivial correlation that are disassortative and, you know, they have this clustering coefficient going like k to the minus one um, uh, naturally. Um, so if I, I refer to you to the, to the paper for that. But now I want to tell you about a different approach. So we have looked at modeling with equilibrium methods. And then we, um, I'm also uh, very passionate to, um, to study non-equilibrium growth model. And in the context of simplicial complexes, this is very strictly related to um, the problem of characterizing network topology and geometry. So uh, as I said, you know, there has been a lot of uh, understanding about the statistical property of a network, but it is becoming more and more clear that it, it, it would be important to have a fully developed theory of discrete geometry uh, for, for network data. And, and uh, in fact, you know, the knowledge of the underlying maybe hidden geometry of a network uh, is, is thought to be important from brain research to routing protocol in the internet. So the idea sometimes is that, you know, two nodes are connected to, a to each other in a network if they are close in this hidden uh, geometry. But actually, all mm, the mass majority of models there in, in, in assume that the network geometry is, is given, you know, you have a given curvature of the space, a given space, and then the linking probability depends on this space. But here we took a very different approach and we ask ourselves, is the natural geometry, if it's there, of complex system, a priori prerequisite for the network evolution, or it is an emergent phenomenon of the network dynamics? And this very abstract kind of idea is actually uh, relevant for complex system if you want to extract this hidden geometry for complex system but it's also uh, a, an idea that is shared by um, quantum uh, gravity approach in which um, most of the approach going from causal dynamical triangulation to tensor network rely Sometimes, some, somewhat on a discretization of the space and use simplicial complexes. So our approach is approach of emergent geometry. So in the framework of emergent geometry, a network with the distinct geometrical signature uh, is generated by a non-equilibrium dynamics that is purely combinatorial. So that is completely independent on the network geometry. And so we we took uh, we we consider just a one very simple model, combinatorial model that is a model of growing simplicial complexes. So you start with a single d-dimensional simplex, and at every step you add a new d-dimensional simplex formed by new node attached to a d minus one phase. So you, for instance, take a triangle with a new node and you attach the, the one of its link to an existing link of the network. And the attachment, so the way in which you choose this, this link, this phase new, depends on a parameter flavor that can take value minus one, zero and one. And we choose that this uh, probability depends on the incidence number of the d minus one phase mu and the flavor s in this way. So if we look uh, closely at this attachment probability, we see that if the flavor is minus one, 
then this attachment probability is proportional to one minus the incidence number. This means that if the incidence number of a D minus one phase is zero, you can still add a D simplex, but if it's one, you cannot. So in this way, you generate by enforcing this combinatorial constraint, you generate discrete manifold. If S is equal to zero, then every uh, D minus one phase as equal probability to receive a D simplex. And if S equal to one, you have what, you know, in natural science term, you would call a generalized preferential attachment. So you, for instance, if you have a link, um, the probability to attach a triangle to a link is proportional to how many triangles are already attached to it. Interesting, so you, you see this generalizing, gener, generalized preferential attachment is only present for S equal one, but actually you have, um, due to the uh, combinatorics of this uh, geometry, discrete geometry, you, you have an emergent preferential attachment and the probability of attaching a D-dimensional simplest to a delta dimensional phase can, can be uh, uh, li uh, linear in K when this constraint is satisfied. And this constraint is satisfied also if, uh, for instance, S is equal to zero, and also if S is equal to minus one, as long as the dimension is large enough. And we will go back to it. So in particular, with the master equation approach that has been developed very widely in the network contest, you can uh, find this table in which the generalized degree distribution depends on the flavor of the network and the dimension delta of, of the phase. So if you look at the degree distribution in particular, for S equal to one, you find that the, uh, this network geometry with flavor are always scale free. This is expected. But for S equal to zero, you find that R scale free for D greater than one. And this is an outcome of the geometry and is due to the fact that if you attach a triangle uniformly to each link, then you are actually end up attaching a, a new link to a node preferentially to uh, proportionally to how many links it has already. And also when you construct manifold, as long as D is greater than two, then you get scale free. So in some sense, this scale free distribution can be just an outcome uh, of geometrical, ge uh, geometrical organization of this graph. And the analytical prediction are very well in agreement with simulation. But here we are also interested in network geometry, not only in the statistical property of this network. And actually we can assign, we can assume that each link has equal length. And in this case, you, uh, you can consider an hyperbolic space in which you put the node at the ideal point, just at the boundary of this space. And this is the initial triangle. And then you attach triangle um, uh, uh, random triangle to, to link. Sorry. And then you find this structure. So you find uh, a really a, 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 what is a random ferrograph, and the ferrograph is the deterministic version of this lattice, which is a well known hyperbolic lattice in D equal to 2. So you, we see an emergent geometry there. And in 3D, you can start with the tetrahedra, and then you can uh, stack tetrahedra to tetrahedra, forming this structure. And you see all the nodes are at the boundary again of this hyperbolic space. And actually, you don't lose anything. So this is a kind of holographic property of this simplicial complex. You don't lose anything if you just project all this network on the surface. Of, 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 this, um, of this space. And uh, of course you lose the, the volume uh, information, but then you don't lose any, uh, any information about the links and the nodes. So the network remains unchanged. And if you just project that on the surface of this ball, you find this structure, which is again, a very particular structure which can be recognized as a random Apollonian graph. So these networks that are poorly combinatorial, 
then they display this very important geometrical property. And the Apollonian graph are a known um, network formed by triangles which are triangulated iteratively, which have very important uh, group structure and, and they are related to sphere packing and are very important structure. And the network geometry with flavor grows in, in a way that is uh, not deterministic. So you can, cons and then as a dual, which is a tree, so you can um, think of it uh, in, in this way. Okay, so here we, with this result, we have seen how the modeling of simplicial complex can generate either null models or so model in which we try to um, uh, remove any other information from, from, the, from the constraint that we are considering. And also non-equilibrium model can help us understand the basic mass mechanism for emergent network geometry. So the basic combinatorial rules that are enabled to generate uh, manifold, discrete manifold and uh, geometry. So I will now move to dynamics and uh, in particular I will discuss uh, in this talk only uh, application or you know studies of, of the Kuramoto model of the synchronization dynamics on simplicial complex but of course and I'm also very interested in percolation but there is no time to to go over that now. So the Kuramoto model is a fundamental dynamical process that involves uh, synchronization of uh, neurons in the brain or fireflies in the forest. And has been fascinating uh, mathematician and physicist, starting from Huygens, which was uh, looking at the synchronization of two pendulum clocks hanging from the same wooden beam. And but only uh, in 74, uh, the Japanese physicist Yoshiki Kuramoto introduced a proper statistical mechanics model for synchronization in which you can characterize the phase transition uh, when a set of nodes start to, uh, in which are hosting uh, this dynamical variable, tries to uh, start to synchronize together. So essentially you have a network in which you have every, every node sustain a dynamical variable, a clock, that in absence of the network oscillate at its own frequencies. And these frequencies are different from different nodes and drawn for given distribution, for instance, the Gaussian distribution. And then you have the network and the network uh, impose uh, in, the, in the dynamical equation impose, uh, inclu inclu in, in, is characterized by you know, a coupling constant and a term that tries to align uh, the phase of one node with the average phase of the neighbor nodes, with the neighbor nodes. And um, yes, yeah, so and this, uh, and so although every phase would oscillate with zone frequency in absence of the network. If the coupling constant sigma is large enough, then you have uh, this emergent synchronization phenomena. So how, what is the order parameter of this uh, tr um, transition? Where is R, which is defined in this way, where uh, I here is uh, the complex number. And in a infinite network limit you you really have this um, r can be uh, zero if the coupling constant is less than the critical one and r is finite if the coupling constant is greater than the critical one in a finite network what you have that is r is close to zero in the um, in the sub in subcritical regime in the unsynchronized regime so but in the infinite network where the model is fully characterized, then you have this beautiful phase transition as a function of R from, that goes from a zero value. So here all the phase oscillate with their own frequency. So there is no global 
phenomena, collecting phenomena in the network, to a phase in which you can detect, you know, this, this collective phenomenon. I have to mention that while on a fully connected network, this uh, Kuramoto model is, is fully understood, However, in, in also in single network, uh, the analysis is much more challenging and uh, often relies on some approximation. So it's not a completely um, a complete understood theory in general uh, in, in, a, in a network. So the first thing if we want to apply the Kuramoto model on simply shared complex is just to put uh, the phase on the node of the simply shared complex and just focus on the network structure. Just forget about this, the triangle, the tetrahedra that are there, just look at the network structure. And this is what we did initially, but uh, we consider a network with a, an intrinsic uh, geometrical character. We had, so we have applied this Kuramoto model, the standard one in which the phase is associated to a node to the network geometry with flavor. Later on, I will show you how we can also define the Kuramoto model in which the phases instead are associated to the links and to the triangle of, of the simply shared complexes. So let's start with synchronization on simply shared complex skeleton with finite spectral dimension. So this work was inspired by collaboration that I did um, some, some years ago with uh, Vincent Torre from uh, CISA University, uh, which uh, involved me in a research question that is really fascinated, fascinating, that is, well, uh, the, the finding, the experimental finding that uh, on t the, the neural culture grown on uh, two-dimensional slides are less synchronized than, three, than neural col culture grown on 3D scaffold, so in, on, on nanotubes, for instance. And so this dependent of the synchronization phenomenon on dimension is, is really fascinating. And so we, we started working with Torre and then I, I thought that more abstractly, I could relate to this question by looking at these simply shell complex models that are in somewhat far from, from the reality of neural culture, but still can mathematically uh, reveal something about this relation with the dimensionality. So, and here I need to introduce uh, the graph Laplacian, which is an important actor in all the second part of the talk, which is an operator uh, defined on network and is a semi-definite, uh, semi-positive uh, definite operator, so that in a connected network has just one single zero again value. And this operator and the spectral property are key to understand the relation between the network structure and the network geometry and the dynamics, because they are fairly defined starting from the network structure, but they play a key role for diffusion and synchronization of the dynamics. So, graph Laplacian um, have been studied um, extensively, and one particular uh, a eigen value is particularly important is the Fiedler eigen value that is the second um, largest eigen value in a connected network which is the non-zero smallest non-zero one and the larger is lambda two the faster is equilibrium and uh, the, the faster is the re relaxation of a diffusion process and lambda two is very big on random graph on expanders but actually if you have lattices lambda 2 goes to zero in the thermodynamic limit. And this really indicates us that the fact that lambda 2 goes to zero, so the spectral gap closes, is a signature of the underlying geometry of this discrete network. And moreover, if the spectral gap closes, one can define the spectral dimension ds, which describes how 
the, um, the density of eigenvalue lambda uh, grow for small eigenvalue lambda. So if, if lambda 2 goes to zero, not only lambda 2, but also lambda 3 and lambda 4 are important to describe the relaxation to equilibrium. And, and in, in particular, instead of looking just at lambda 2 and lambda 3, you can look directly at the spectral dimension. And, uh, and so these networks are characterized by a very long relaxation uh, time. And uh, we have looked at uh, the Apollonian graph and we have seen that um, the Apollonian graph has a spectral dimension that can be predicted with uh, uh, RG calculation. We, in this work with uh, Sergei Dorodotsev, we have predicted the spectral um, dimension of the Apollonian graph. And actually, we have looked also at NGF, and NGF uh, they might have a different spectral dimension due to their randomness and also are characterized by less stringent symmetries of the network. So the degeneracy of the eigenvalue that you see on the Apollonian graph is washed out. I mean, is, 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 is um, uh, uh, reduced. So we look at NGF in particular of different dimension, the NGF of flavor S minus one, and we've seen numerically that the spectral dimension changes with the dimension of the simplicial complex in almost linear way for, for small value of the dimension. So for D equal to two, three, and four, we find that the spectral dimension increase uh, in a linear way. So how this spectral dimension is related to the Kuramoto model? Well, if you linearize the Kuramoto model and you, 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 if you practically approximate the design of the difference of the phase just by the difference of the phase, then you find this linear model and the, the, the matrix here is just the graph Laplace. So this constitutes the link between um, the spectral dimension and the Kuramoto model and actually so if you want to study the uh, stability of the synchronization phenomena, then the spectral property of the Laplacian will be important. So we have done, uh, we studied the Kuramoto model uh, on um, natural geometry with flavor, and this is uh, the, the plot of R, the order parameter versus sigma. So you see for sigma that is significantly high, we see something uh, that is well behaved, it seems that the system has uh, reached synchronization state. Then we see something very funky here, which is a signature that the time series have not reached the stationary state. So these are uh, the outcome of the fact that the signal is actually fluctuating a lot. And then we reach a state in which R is zero. So if you want a visual picture of what is happening, you can look at here, the phases are the color of the nodes, and in the unsynchronized phase, you see every node oscillate with different uh, uh, frequency. Then you have the synchronized phase in this finite network in which every node has uh, the same uh, frequency, difference in phase, but the same frequency. And then you have this frustrated synchronization phase, this, this funky phase in which you see very strong spatial temporal fluctuation of the order parameter. And actually, if you do a stability analysis of, of the pro pro process, the Kuramoto process, you see that actually if the spectral dimension ds is less than four, less or equal than four, then the, the, the synchronized phase that you've seen in the, in the simulation on finite network are not reached in the thermodynamic limit. So the, the system will be dominated just by this uh, frustrated synchronization phase. And the dimension uh, in the spectral dimension, the S equal to four, meaning that the network can be embedded in uh, dimension uh, four minus one, three, then is the state in which you have marginally stable synchronization. So here you, you really see, and also in the paper we study the dependence 
on, on D from the simulation, you see, you see the dependence on, on the spectral dimension and the dimension of the simplex um, of the synchronization property that can shed some light on the experimental result of Vincent Torre. So um, let, let me just move um, quickly to uh, the other uh, work that I've been doing, and um, uh, which has been published by PRL recently. And in this work, we wanted to, so while well, before I, I told you how Kuramoto model is affected by geometry, so by the spectral dimension, which is a geometrical um, quantity. Here I will tell you how Kuramoto model is affected by topology. So, and we want to characterize a synchronization defined on, 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 uh, on uh, topological signals. So on signals that are not defined just on nodes, but are faces associated to links or triangles and so on. And for this, I need to give you a crash uh, overview of algebraic topology. I hope that is not too heavy. So until now, we have considered simplices just as a set of D plus one uh, node. But actually, in algebraic topology, simplices have an orientation. So for instance, take the link one, two. It has an orientation from one to two which is different from the link 2, 1, which is an orientation from 2 to 1. And similarly, a triangle has an orientation. And what you need to do to not, not to make any error and to find something consistent with algebraic topology is a trick, is that you associate to each node a label from 1 to n. And then every simplex is associated to a, an ordering between let's say the smallest number to the highest number. OK, and then the result that we will get with algebraic topology will be independent on the labeling. OK, so for instance, you go from one to three. This is a positive uh, direction from one to two positive direction and you'd go from one to two to three along the triangle. Given this um, this convention, uh, you define uh, M chains. Uh, M chains uh, consist of the element of a free abelian group with basis, with basis formed by the set of oriented N simplices. So don't be scared. This means that an, a one chain, for instance, is a linear combination of the link with coefficient one or minus one. And you can interpret a one chain like this one as this uh, red um, red uh, set of arrow. So you go from one to three. So you go from three to two. So you get minus two, three. And then you go from two to four. OK, so these are the one chain which have this topological interpretation, but are also can be treated algebraically. So on this one chain, which is your linear space, you define an operator, which is a boundary operator, which associates to each simplices uh, uh, um, uh, n minus uh, to each simplex, uh, n-dimensional simplex, uh, um, n minus one chain, which is formed by the simplices at this boundary. So for instance, you have the link one, two, the boundary is just two minus one. And if you have, you know, the triangle one, one, two, three, then the boundary will be one, two, two, three, minus three, one, because you go around the triangle. And so interesting, this boundary operator has the property that the boundary of the boundary is null. So if you do, you know, you just, um, you have a triangle, you do the boundary, you find these three links, and then you want to do, find the boundary of these three links, and it's zero. And this is really reflected also algebraically. So you, you, you concatenate these two operators and you find a null operator. So this might seem very abstract, but is actually all 
translatable into matrix form. So you knew this bat matrix, this um, boundary operator is just a linear operator. So you can describe it with matrices that are not square matrices, but are rectangular matrices. So B1 is the matrix in which the uh, row are the node and the column are the link. And then, it, and then from every uh, column, you have the boundary of this link. So the boundary, the coefficient of the boundary of this link, one, the boundary of one, two is minus one node one plus one node two and so on. And you can do define also B2 in a similar way. Of course, these matrices, when you multiply to each other, they give a zero matrix uh, because the boundary of the boundary is known. So this is all what we not need to know about these incidence matrices with the addition that we need to know that these boundary matrices are really uh, fundamental to understand Laplacian because Laplacian can be described, defined with the adjacency matrix, but also can be defined in this way using the incidence matrix. And in this expression, it's really transparent why L0 is a semi-definite positive matrix, because this is uh, quadratic, okay? So this is the graph Laplacian, but actually in topology, the, there is a lot of interest in higher order Laplacian, which are defined by incidence matrix N, M, B, N plus one. And these are quite important in topology because as the degeneracy of the zero uh, eigenvalue for the graph Laplacian is just the number of connected component, the degeneracy of the zero eigenvalue of the up Laplacian is the m number. So it's the number of n-dimensional cavity for n equal to one, the number of uh, loops the num uh, for n equal to two, the number of two-dimensional cavity. And the higher order Laplacian uh, can be decomposed into a component B down and a component L, uh, L down, L, uh, L, uh, Laplacian down and Laplacian up, which is given in this term. Finally, and this I promise is the last uh, information about algebraic topology for the moment. Um, this uh, higher order Laplacian have a very nice uh, structure because this uh, higher order Laplacian uh, Ln and uh, Ln up and Ln down are commuting and can be diagonalized simultaneously. So practically uh, you have um, that uh, an eigenvector of the higher order Laplacian L is, is also in the care uh, in, of in, an eigenvector in the curve of Ln is also in the curve of Ln up and Ln down. An eigenvector corresponding to a non-zero eigenvalue of the higher order Laplacian is either a non-zero eigenvector of Ln up or a non-zero eigenvector of Ln down. So practically, the up, the up, uh, higher order uh, up Laplacian and higher order down Laplacian act on different spaces. Okay, so. They are non-zero on different spaces. So one can really decompose the space into three parts. The, the part of eigenvector of the, the Laplacian, so associated to the cavity, and a part of associated to the eigenvector of L up, and a part, as, as I said, the non-zero eigenvector of L down. So with this, we are ready to define uh, explosive higher order Kuramoto model. And we are interested again, as I mentioned to you, to signals defined on links. So topological signals, clocks defines on links or on triangles and so on, not anymore on node. And there are signals defined on higher order simplices, in particular fluxes in brain networks, in biological networks, they are very important very important, but up to now there is no evidence yet that these signals synchronize and I will come later on on this question. So what uh, we uh, what we know is that the standard Kuramoto model that I defined previously 
can be just expressed in terms of the incidence matrix B1 and B1 transmodes in this simple term, where theta is the vector of phases associated to the node and omega is the vector of frequencies associated to the node. But here we are interested, so but we can express that directly with B1 and B1 transpose. So here we are interested in topological signals. So we define uh, phases associated to n-dimensional simplices. So for instance, uh, to a link, we associate a flux that can oscillate. And then we define a higher order Kuramoto model just by extending the previous uh, expression for the graph Kuramoto model to the higher order Kuramoto model. So this is the minimal uh, expression that generalized the previous version, but it was not uh, formal. Was not uh, we we formalized that for the first time. So. Interesting, so this uh, equation can be integrated and interesting a question that you can ask yourself is that if we define a Kuramoto model on links, let's say uh, on links, so what is the projected dynamics on nodes for instance and what is the projected dynamics on triangles? So in general, what is the dynamics on n minus one phase or n plus one phase? And here we just can apply to to our dynamical variable theta, the incidence numbers, the, the inc sorry, the incidence matrices, and, and and this incidence matrix, if we define n, we we work with n equal to one, define just the discrete curl for the triangle. So to each triangle, we define the curl of the signals around it, and for each node, we define the divergence of the node. And then we apply this uh, um, on this matrix on the uh, on this uh, equation, and we find, due to the fact that uh, the, the boundary of the boundary is null, we find a simplified dynamics in which the projected dynamics on nodes and links totally uh, is independent, is totally decoupled. So we have two synchronization dynamics. And we can look at the, at the order parameter of this dynamics and we find the synchronization transition. And actually, the, the, the referee asked us also to, to produce a theory for that. So we have a, a phenomenological theory for that, which predicted that the transition occur uh, at, at uh, coupling constant zero. Interesting, if you just consider the end signals and the order parameter, associated to it, you find nothing. That means that this the signal is not visible if you don't produce non generate the important filtering that is related to topology. So and we can just act also on n dimensional simplices, but then if we are apply Ln up or Ln down, then we see again the transition. So this this operator uh, Ln up and Ln down work as filtering, topological filtering of the signal that reveal the synchronization of this model. So if you have an experiment, you will not be able to find this transition if you don't apply the right topological signal. So this is uh, one of our uh, results on uh, synchroniz higher order synchronization, but then we also consider explosive higher order synchronization. So what happens if uh, we couple these two dynamics, practically uh, the part of the dynamics that uh, contributes to the projection of node and the part of the dynamics that contributes to the projection on, on, on triangle. And we couple in this way, so we put the order parameter of one in front of the other in order that when we apply the projected dynamics, then these two equations do not couple anymore. Yes, because L up and L down act on different uh, subspace that do not speak to each other, but we have modulated the coupling constant with the order parameter of the other. 
And this is a, 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 an approach that was used, for instance, on multiplex networks by, by Boccaletti and his group to in, enforce explosive synchronization of multiplex network. And so we apply that in this way to higher order synchronization and we find explosive synchronization phenomena. So the, the, the transition is really uh, discontinuous and this is also validated by this phenomenological analytical approach that we develop in, in this paper. So again, if we consider the n-dimensional uh, simplices, the the trivial one, the trivial order parameter one wants to define is not sensible to this transition, but when we apply the filtering, we see this transition. And all these results are worked uh, on the, configura the configuration model, but we have also applied that to the uh, network geometry with flavor. I've not shown the result, but we have also applied that on data of real connectome, including Homo sapiens connectome and C. elegans, finding again evidence for this discontinuous transition. So I reached my conclusion. Uh, so I wanted to give you an overview of the interplay between simplicial complexes and then geometry and topology and their role in determining dynamics. And simplicial complexes are becoming more and more fashionable to study the many body interaction of complex system. And from my perspective, they are really powerful if you want to understand the relation between uh, natural structure and their underlying uh, uh, geometry and topology. And I, I described to you some modeling uh, approach of both maximum entropy and um, non-equilibrium model that explain the basic mechanism of emergent geometry and then I discuss with you uh, two, uh, two, 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 two work on synchronization, uh, one which ref uh, reveal the interplay between network geometry, so the spectral dimension and dynamics, and now the other which reveal the interplay between network topology and dynamics because this higher order uh, transition our uh, higher order Kuramoto model are really um, highly dependent on, on, on a treatment for topology. And in particular, if you don't have the right topological, um, if you don't do the right topological uh, operation on the signals, you are not able to reveal this transition also maybe in experiments. So, I would like to conclude here and thanks my collaborators, in particular um, Anna Paula Milian and Joaquin Torres that have been uh, very important to uh, study this Kuramoto model in, uh, in simplicial complexes in, in, both, uh, series, in both series of uh, work and um, yes, and all the code or that you is, are listed here. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, uh, you Dinesta. So now we have some time for questions. Uh, I see Stefano Ruffo uh, as a question. So long ago, Elisha Moses and uh, Jean-Pierre Ekman introduced uh, a sort of groom of uh, curvature on networks. It was, uh, I think, a single paper, and then uh, I don't know if the, the idea was followed. I, I, I would like to understand, uh, or if you know, uh, if there is a connection between the, 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 this approach uh, and the simplicial approach. Yeah, so the gram of curvature is um, is um, is, is actually uh, used, I think, to characterize the hyperbolicity uh, of the network, um, and I think is based uh, on 
um, yes, looking for instance also at distance between four nodes, three nodes, it does not require a simplicial complex approach, but um, Yes, it, it, it is one of the um, very important approach to characterize curvature um, in, in in network in discrete geometry. There are this this field is really booming, so there are um, a lot of uh, research on simplicial complex in particular. There is this Forman Forman curvature, which is addressing. Uh, the curvature of simplicial complex, and then there is maybe may, my favorite, which is the Regge curvature. Um, but but um, yes, yes, and the group of, for instance, the group of uh, Jurgen Jost has been working very actively on on that in, in recent years. Yes, so uh, unfortunately, there is no consensus uh, yet on the best uh, way to define the curvature mostly because you typically get a, uh, also Renate Lol has been working on that but the, you, you usually get a scalar quantity instead of a tensor and so this uh, raises a lot of <laughs> problem right to make uh, the connection with continuous uh, geomet geometries. Thank you, Ginessa. Uh, Roberto Livi has a question. Yes, Ginessa, uh, I'm sorry, my connection doesn't work that much well. So I have I would like to, to, to understand better what you claim at the end of your seminar. In order to have an explosive transition, you need some specific uh, topological feature of the network. Did I understand correctly? And if I understood correctly, which is the minimal condition to get that? So um, what wh what I uh, what I say is uh, slightly different. So we we don't we don't see for the moment. We have some variation of these models in which we see some interplay between different topology and the dynamics. But now for the moment we see that in all simplicial complex in which we have applied these higher order synchronization, we, we see a very similar behavior um, or some discrepancy that are not so relevant to, you know, to, to put your, your end on, on, on the fire and that you see really some difference. And this explosive um, uh, phenomenon is due to this coupling of you know practically you have two decouple this 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 arch decomposition allow you to define a, a dynamics on the lens that really decouples into two spaces because you mm -hmm. have this structure that uh, that is called arch decomposition in which the dynamics decouple in two spaces so it is a situation very similar to a multiplex network where you have one network and the other network the only difference is that you don't have the same set of nodes because one are the number of links, the other one the number of triangles. So in, in general, uh, the the two spaces don't have the same number of elements. Um, so this is different from the multiplex network, but you practically have two synchronization okay. dynamics and you couple them with uh, this mechanism oh, proposed by the Paletti. <laughs> so is it is that clear? Uh, yes, it's clear. No, I'm sorry, I misunderstood probably your statement, but it, you are saying that you always find such a situation in some sense if you have. Yes, yes but you need to. Yeah, you need to apply. So if you just add the standard order parameter. Yeah. On the find, for instance, on the links, you don't find anything. You need okay. to apply this because practically the dynamics defined of the links is the result of two dynamics on two different subspaces mm -hmm. that can have practically synchronization on different frequencies. So when you use plot, take the signals all together, you don't see anything because 
Yeah, yeah, understand. It's not global synchronization, but if you separate, you filter out, then you, you then you get it. it. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Okay, uh, Tommaso Gili has a question. Yeah. Yes, this is Tommaso Gili. Uh, thanks, uh, Ginessa, for the very, very interesting and interesting talk. I have a question about the uh, the natural, uh, 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 sorry, uh, the the the, the multi-body uh, description of the simplex uh, uh, aspect with the normal wise description of the. Uh, of the uh, that you can have with a network, a typical network uh, approach, um, and this is. Uh, and the question is, uh, how much this uh, uh, view of simplexes uh, uh, as multi-body interaction dependent uh, on the quality of the interaction? What I mean is that let, let's do, let's take the, the brain as a, as a, an example. You you can consider the brain. Uh, divided in different regions, but it can be studied both at the structural level, considering the, uh, the direct connections, uh, the, the, the physical connections, the wiring of the regions, uh, and that on, that on that side you can consider it as a many body problem because you have many uh, direct interactions between different nodes, and the functional part of the description of the brain, which is mainly based on the covariance, which is a pairwise description, pairwise interaction. Uh, 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 do you think that uh, uh, there are uh, uh, um, quote, certain uh, kind of interactions that can be seen only as a pairwise so that are not, uh, as, uh, not allowed to be used, to be included in a simplicial uh, description or not? Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so thank you so much. Yes, um, so I think for brain research, uh, yeah, uh, there is this paper, which is a review paper from which I took the, um, the picture, which says exactly this, that instead of taking, you know, a pairwise correlation, you can take, uh, you know, um, um, a correlate, three-body three correlation function. Um, so uh, practically you can do a conditioning on a third and, and, and measuring the correlation. And uh, so, you know, intuitively it explains the difference between three, broad, three region of the range of the brain per y, correlated per wise or three, re, three region of the brain that are co-activated always at the same time. This is like a three-body interaction in that case. But I have to admit, I think maybe the, uh, um, the most developed part is kind of structural and is coming from the field of uh, blue, the, the, the research of Blue Brain and uh, Catherine Hess in uh, Switzerland. And what they do is that in, the, in their Blue Brain uh, simulation, so reconstruction, of, of the brain at a very fine level of description. Then they look for clicks essentially, and they interpret clicks as uh, synthesis. In particular, they also impose some direction to the clicks. But, um, yeah, well, actually it's not only structural, so they, they link the topology also with the act activation dynamics in the simulation. So yeah, it, in fact, it's not only structural, but is in any case uh, at the level of single neurons, while the other approach that I was mentioning is at the level of brain region. Um, so yeah, of course, for instance, if you can, you can look at uh, correlation, conditional correlation, right, on, on data set, then there is an important part of noise, I mean, because, um, yes, uh, high quality data are, 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 are always 
necessary and required. But yeah, yeah, I I, I think we we can expect the data to to reach a very good level soon, and there are already several application of simplicial complex on real data that are quite straightforward for instance for instance on collaboration networks or face to face interaction okay thank you very much any further questions Okay, so if there are uh, no more questions, I think we can uh, thank again uh, the speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye to everybody. Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. -bye.